Tasia, thank you so much for coming on the show. Um, my sum up of you very quickly is you are a voiceover actor and Emmy award winning voiceover actor. You've had roles such as Poison Ivy in the Batman series, um, numerous other video game uh, titles, but also cartoons, movies. Um, you've given TEDx talks as well on how people can project great voice um, and you now teach people how they can use their voice in certain situations to either gain confidence, gain respect, gain people listening to them. It's such an important skill. Um, that's my quick sum up of you, but I guess for people listening along now that don't know you, yeah, tell us a bit about yourself. Well, thank you for that lovely introduction. That is, that is a lot to, to take in, and I receive it <laughs> as you offer it, Tim. And it's a, it's a delight to be with you. Um, my background is, I, you know, I actually jokingly say I'm a recovering actress and a fully functioning voiceover artist. Awesome. Damaged goods when you're an actor, you know, it's really a tough, tough uh, road. Tough and, yeah. Uh, yeah, and I started that when I was 15 years old. I did my first movie. I was discovered actually by uh, the late director, Louis Mal, who was a French director and really well known in the 80s and 90s for making um, some very interesting movies. Um, and so I started as an actress and then I went on to a soap opera, All My Children, uh, which is also very popular and now no longer, this was again during the heyday of soaps when there was only one television in a room as opposed to, you know, a phone. Mm. Phone, right. multiple, multiple devices. Uh, That's right. Yeah. Back then it was in a college room or in, uh, you know, in the dormitories. One, one television soap, soap operas were like the big thing and uh, I was on there for three years and that's where I was actually nominated for an Emmy as a, as a, um, uh, sorry. Oops. Okay. Yeah. I just wanted to. For those listening on, that was just a camera almost falling, but all good. <laughs> yeah. I'm just going to close my mail because I just got this yeah. mail. It's kind of silly. I, I don't know why I didn't close it. No, no. <laughs> all good. All good. It didn't come through on my end, so that's fine. Oh, that's this, this is always usually the most fun parts of the show. I tend to leave this stuff in for people. Oh, um, right. that's fine. Yeah, technology yeah. is wonderful, right? It's like technology. my nails went off. Like, can you see all that? So <laughs> no, I'm glad you can. I'm just going to get rid of all the mail. Oh, I can't see it. No, 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 we can't see it on this. No, side. I mean, for myself, I like it's a distraction. Like, I'm like, oh, I, okay. I just want to be focused and give you great eye contact as well as great voice. So I don't want to like look at it like, oh, no, there's a job. <laughs> yeah, yeah, fair enough, fair yeah. enough. That's the thing. We're all so distracted nowadays. So yeah, it's so well, easy to get. It, it actually leads in. That leads into what you were saying. Like back in the day, it was one television, but now we've got one laptops. television, one focus, and that that was what. And I I was actually addicted to soaps myself. I was I was watching at home and cutting school a little bit once in a while, and uh, actually wanted to be on that show. So it was pretty amazing at sixteen to get on there. So I, I acted. From 15 till all the way through my early 20s, I'd say middle 20s, and my mother, who was also very supportive of my acting career because she had been a singer and actress, suggested I do voiceovers. And I was, uh, again, this was such a niche thing back then that nobody really knew what a voiceover artist was, early 90s. And I, and I, I said, you know, I don't even know how to get into this, but being a great mother, she nagged me until I started checking it out and found that uh, I was really good at it, but also I was really liberated from all the things that as an actor you were confined to, which is so much more than your ability to act. I mean, mm. your ability to act, I would say is maybe 40% and I'm being generous, but you know, being and looking exactly what somebody had in mind, the casting director, the director, that's, something that you know voiceover liberates you from and so all of a sudden I started getting role after role after role after role that on camera was always like you were amazing but you were to this you were to that you weren't enough of this and I was I was finding that uh, that all the talent and all the ability to give great voice was now being honed to its best ability and so I did more and more voiceover and recognized over a period of six years that not only was I 
having more fun and more joy, but my mental health was literally going up in proportion to the amount of voiceovers I was doing, as my therapist said to me. And I took that as a note, like, you know, there's something to this. And I recognized that. Yeah, um, that, yeah that's, that's fantastic. Yeah. yeah. So I started doing that, and then uh, I d- d- closed the door on my on-camera career, exclusively devoted myself to voiceovers, and then I've been doing that for the last 25 years and counting and it's still Christmas on Sunday every time I get a job so it's it's a great uh, bit of gratitude that I have for it and then uh, in the last five years I've been teaching it uh, to to voiceover actors and through that process realized that this same concept I can teach to non voiceover actors because it's really um, so accessible about what it means to really understand how to best use your voice in every role that we play because we play roles whether we realize it or not i play roles on camera as a voice of artist and then in my life i play roles too and mm. so do you and so does everybody so i've been able to translate this notion now and teach this form of verbal confident communication from my own unique perspective yeah oh there's so much in there that you just said that i that i really want to that I really want to, I really want to unpack. No, no, then that's a fantastic thing about it. Um, going back to the the acting was only forty percent of of you in person. You know, you might be just that little bit too tall or too short, or you might too have bad or too, you know, yeah, really huge. And that really, and you touched on the mental health side. I, I've been very open on this podcast um, with with my mental health and and the journeys that I've gone through. Um, but the, I guess the, the stress and the insecurities and the anxieties that, that that's 60% in, in person acting would put on people would have been such a hard time. So I guess, yeah, how did you cope with that before you found voice acting? Because voice acting then goes, wow, the other way. Now we, we're just going on your pure talent because we can make a cartoon. We can, we can, you know, we can visual effect poison ivy to the way we want poison ivy to look we just now want the voice you know and and, and talent that's skills. and the talent yeah. so, so and then you just walk in there and and you you smash it so um i guess i'll go back to the question yeah how do you how did you cope with that that 60 percent when you were in that mind frame of i want to be an actor not very well yeah <laughs> not very well and i don't think a lot of people would I think that's a no. fairly normal. Yeah. No, I was I was terribly insecure. I had eating disorders related to my weight because one of the definitely the issues was I was never thin enough. I just wasn't made that way. You know, naturally, not in my. Which is which is a tragedy. Which is a tragedy. I mean, um, I'll get in trouble with my girlfriend here. You you know, you are an attractive human being. So it's a tragedy that someone said you were too big. It's always, always. That was definitely one of the issues. And so um, that was one of the things when my therapist, you know, I went to therapy to, to because I love working on myself. And uh, it was something that I have always um, been a big proponent of. And nowadays it's, you know, it's much more de rigueur. But I started when I was 15 because my father, who was also a, re- a recovering actor, came to rest to therapy in the 60s when it was really just like Freud, you know, very unusual and kind of a negative connotation. But he really supported me doing it at an early age. And um, that was something that I definitely suffered from was that very low self-esteem given the fact that I was always being rejected. And that's the thing about being an actor versus you know, in different professions when you're making something and it's separate from you. Mm. It's still something you've extended yourself, you've given it, but when you're the one totally rejected. It's you, yeah. It's huge versus a paper you wrote or an advertisement you made. It's like, you are not enough, you are not. So yes, I suffered greatly. And I think that was, again, one of those aha moments of recognizing that, uh, you know, the voice acting allowed me to finally use what I knew was there and to free it up to fully express itself without the rejecting uh, aspect of it that you're not enough of this all the time. So 
you know, that's why I decided ultimately to close the door completely on acting and completely devote myself because I, I, I actually felt um, that it would help me in my personal life, which it did because my, my then uh, husband, who was my boyfriend at the time, I recognized Fantastic. that he would not be loving me saying to him even, you know, I'm going away on this island with this very hot guy, but it's totally professional and I'll be back in six weeks. You know? Yeah, very hard. Yeah. yeah. Okay, yeah. Sort of met me. So uh, the combination uh, was uh, the right, everything's timing. And luckily I, I married him and I have three kids and it's 20 years. And yeah. It was, well, no, that, but, but I think that's a fairly normal human reaction. I mean, I had a conversation. I I had a conversation with my girlfriend the other day. Like I go to an in-person podcast with a female entrepreneur that's killing it. And, you know, and um, I, I, I like to take selfies when I finish an episode. So now I'm getting like proximity close to these people. I'm like, <laughs> don't worry, don't worry. Like, you know, it's just podcasting. We're just friends. And, um, you know, she was very, as I'm sure your husband would have been, you know, very understanding. Okay, well, that's just, uh, you know, yours is a different level. Like it might be like on a beach, a romance scene kind of thing. But um, it's it's, the, 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 yeah, I, I totally get that. It's really fun. <laughs> uh, yeah. But you know, in terms of re- re- helping myself, I did find that, yeah, uh, for most actors, it's, it's it, the self-esteem issue plagues, I think, most. Just, mm. you know, so yeah. they either stop acting or they just, you know, decide they don't care anymore. So I, I think it's something that... Um, you know, to find ways to cope with it uh, is is essential, um, and to have that inner belief system. It's much easier when it's no longer about your, you know, this yeah. part. Yeah, definitely. Um, so you made it. You, you made it in voiceover acting, and and there would have been a period before then when when people didn't know of you or know your work or that kind of thing. I'd love to. Because because a lot of people see the success, but they don't see the work under that success. Um, what happened, especially when you went right? I'm going to focus 100% on voice acting. What was the the thing that kept you going, but then also made you stand out in terms of your work, persistence, passion, and talent that you think got you the roles that? Oh, sorry, um, the roles that you're now. Um, that you're now a part of. Um, what do you think it was that, 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 yeah, made you stand out from XYZ voiceover person? Well, that's a lot to unpack too. I know, I know. Yeah. I, I, I think for one thing in terms of uh, that sense of, you know, it was a six-year gentle combination of acting, voiceover, and then more voiceover acting and then realising um, I actually had the opportunity to go back and be on a soap opera. Uh, I had been on one when I was 16 and then I went back to the Bold of the Beautiful and it was a 12 week, it was a 12 week reoccurring part. And I thought, wow, maybe I could do a soap opera and voiceover because I was kind of going in that direction. Uh-huh. And, you know, I, I always feel like the universe supports our endeavors and I, I did 12 weeks on the show and I realized exactly why I hated being on a soap opera <laughs> because I, I was trapped on a set and, 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 you know, even though that was something I enjoyed earlier, now that I had this new life where I was kind of here and there and voiceover is very short and intense, but a lot of it is being available. When you're not available, uh, they don't wait, you know, they move on to the next person. So that is definitely mm. um, a difference where acting, you know, you plan ahead, you book next week. Voiceover, you can be booked the same day, the same hour, the same. So I did this uh, transition. I did the 12 weeks on the show and that's when I called my agent and said, I'm only going to do voiceover. Mm. I was like, I, I felt like the universe had shown me a little arc and it was a wonderful way to bookend my 15 year career on camera and oh, 12, yeah, yeah I could fit, almost 15. And that was a lovely you know, period of time, but it was a definite decision that I'm only going to do this. And there's that part of, you know, do one thing great. I decided I was going to do one yeah. thing great. Yeah, and that's actually important, I guess, um, for listeners listening along. So many people have so many great ideas and they want to go off and do this and that and this and that. And I'm, I'm a big proponent of, uh, a big villain, I suppose, of, of doing that exact thing. But you focused on one thing and it got you the results. So can you speak to how important that actually is? Well, it is in that... I feel too. I and mean, right now I'm kind of in that strange 
I am doing more than one thing because I'm doing the voiceover, I'm teaching the voiceover, and then I'm trying to teach outside. And I do find... But it's that's all yeah. related. It's like the one thing. It's it still... Is. That's not... You're not like conjoining things. Like right. you're... Well, there, you know, there's something to be said for total commitment, total focus, and total belief. And... It takes a lot of dedication and grit to do anything great, right? I mean, the whole 10,000 hours of yeah. Malcolm Gladwell. Um, so there's this aspect that, if, you know, if you kind of are here 50%, 20% here and 30% there, then you never get the ability to just literally become an expert because your your energy and your time and your focus is, is you know, it's diverse, um, so because I decided to become a solely a great voice of artist, I was definitely already heading in the right trajectory. And I think maybe that's the universe kind of, you know, it's the flow. When the flow is good, that's kind of the universe saying, yeah, keep doing what you're doing. This is great. And when the flow is not good, it's like, no, maybe this is not your bag. You know, and not that there's not obstacles to overcome, but the universe was showing me over and over again, I'm booking more and more jobs. I'm enjoying it more. And I'm, I'm making money mm. at this thing. That's still an extension. It's not exactly what I had planned, but look what the universe is telling me. I'm going to go for it. And then after, again, a nice, you know, kind of overlap, I realized I'm going to take the leap and I'm going to focus on this. I can always try to go back later, but I felt intuitively uh, that it was the right thing to do. And I said to myself, I'm going to do this exclusively. I'm going to be the best at it. And then I studied, I auditioned, I studied some more, I auditioned some more, I had more success with it. And then the flow just continued and you know, but to this day, I'm a teacher, but I'm still a student. Mm. I still will go and take a class with a great teacher because mm. that, that's the other thing is that to never stop learning, perfecting the craft, growing is another essential. But whatever it is that you choose, you know, to dive deep. Yeah, I, I definitely can relate to that in what I'm doing with my podcast and my business. I uh, am now showing people how they can create their own amazing shows, amazing content, amazing podcasts on the back end of that, creating some marketing as well. But I'm finding that, yes, I'm putting myself out there as an expert, as a teacher, but I'm also two, I'm two years into this. There's also stuff that four years later, six years later, 10 years later that I'll still be learning as well. So, you know, having that attitude of I'm always a student and being not, not being egotistical about, I know everything, um, can give you so much power, can't it? Yes. I mean, I, and not to mention the fact that we're in this incredible learning paradigm now, right? We can mm, learn from like that. Right. And it used to be that you really had to find the expert. You had to get into the same city as the expert in front of it. And now, I mean, unfortunately it's almost like there's too much information too, <laughs> but you know, learning, you could learn, like you could take a master class with like some of the best experts in the world mm. uh, at your fingertips. So yeah, I, I, I think it, it feeds our creativity and it feeds the fire and the spark, especially when you get a passionate teacher who loves what they're doing, then you, you know, not only are you learning the information, but you're feeling that like, yeah, this is why I'm doing it. So mm. I, I think nowadays it's, a, it's an incredible time to be a student. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. Um, I'd love to, um, it would be amiss of me if I didn't ask about this and your roles, um, especially one I'm passionate about um, myself playing the games, all of them, um, your Poison Ivy role. Um, what was that experience like? How did you land that gig? Um, and yeah, just, just take me into working in that environment. You know, people like Kevin Conroy as well. Um, you know, he's the voice of Batman. Um, yeah, he is. Know. He's been doing that for like 20 something years. He's amazing. So yeah, what was all of those experiences like? Well, I was, you know, already acting as a voiceover artist for a while and, you know, Poison Ivy came up. I had already done another uh, 
kind of iconic role previous to her, which was which I didn't realize at the time again because <laughs> social media wasn't in my life then, so I didn't realize how many gamers there were out there because I played a role Sniper Wolf in Metal Gear Solid, which was like still early on in the video game days, yeah. and it was one of those roles where I found out twenty years later that was very instrumental to this shift of just like shoot him up into an emotional connection to the character because she has this great death scene. And it was like, uh, you know, once I came on social media, people were like, I cried so much at that death scene. So <laughs> thank you so much. And I was like, oh, that's super cool. So anyway, I had dipped my toes into the video game world. And um, when Poison Ivy came up, of course, I, you know, I knew the Marvel world. I thought she was rather iconic and, uh, just did, you know, an open audition for my agency like others and, um, you know, had that seductive quality that I was able to intend with my voice and understood her and, you know, just auditioned and got the part. So it's just one of those, I'd like to say it was more interesting than that, but it was the right place at the right time, the right notion. And yeah. again, you know, when we, we, when we have characters that live inside of us naturally, um, it's easy to draw it out. And, you know, I, I, I've always known how to connect to that side of myself, both as an on-camera actress and then not. Mm. Uh, so, but I love Poison Ivy because I think she's, you know, she's much more multifaceted than she's always given credit for, right? She's, yeah. she's actually a hero in the Arkham games, you know, ultimately. Yeah. And she's considered a villainess, but, you know, that's the beautiful thing about making a character, especially with great writing, and then imbuing compassion and empathy into yeah. them you can make them far more interesting than just a one note character. Well, she's got so many layers. And I, I love that you actually just flipped into Ivy um, there naturally. I, I was actually going to, I, I was actually going to ask you if you could for the audience, yeah, do, do some Ivy voice and, and you just did it. Um, yeah, well, uh, it's, it's pretty much, it lives in me. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's amazing. Um, Really, really, really cool. And but I, the the thing with Ivy that I really liked myself was she is that multifaceted character. You know, it was because of her in the Arkham Knight games that that Batman was able to actually save the day because she decided to come onto his side and help out and create the cure that that was needed, um, or help and help sacrifice herself in the process and sacrifice herself in the process. So how um, how did you? Yeah, how do you make that come across um, in, in an effective way where you're taking this person who's a villain and now she's deciding, oh, hang on, I have to do something good and sacrifice myself. Was there things that you did with voice to make those scenes really hit home a little bit stronger? Well, I think it's like any acting process. You really try to understand the character's intention and this is part of the, what I do with my TEDx and what giving great, we really kind of getting into what giving yeah. great is, yeah, yeah. is that understanding that our voice follows the intention. And so once she decided that she was going to now save Gotham and sacrifice herself in the process, you know, um, the intention is more about, again, empathy and less about revenge which is, you know, when you're a villain and the anger that goes and the rage that goes along with it, even though she's a seductress, it's following the writer's intention to create that sense of, you know, what a hero feels is that I, I, it, it, this is more important than me and I'm willing to have the courage to, to go to the nth degree to, to mm. commit myself to this um, endeavor. And I, I, I just tried to tap into, um, you know, a more courageous part than even I know that I have in myself mm. and to honor her with that. So it's yeah. really understanding intention of what the character is trying to affect. Definitely. Um, just so for context, was something I love in the Ted talk that you did was um, you've, and you've said it a couple of times, Ivy's a seductress, right? So for people listening along, um, you did a really cool thing where you did poison Ivy's voice. You know, she's trying to get Batman closer and then you did an opposite um, version of what that would sound like. Could, could you do that for us now just so people can understand the difference in giving in great budget. voice? And Yeah, yes. if, you, if you don't mind. Um, sure. I'll just it. break it down that the simplest Thanks. way that giving great voice really means is it literally just is understanding 
what an actor understands in a scene and that we can apply this in our lives. So who am I in the scene of my life? It's four questions. Who am I? Who am I speaking to? What do I want? And how does my voice support that intention? So it's so simple, but it's, you know, it can be very complex. But the simple thing is, if when I'm given a role and you, you, I read the description, sometimes you get a vision of it, but you read the descriptors, you know, if Ivy is a villainess, but she's always a seductress, that, that quality of what seduction is comes through the voice, if you know, because we, we have senses of what we've heard of our lives of what a seductress sounds like. So if she's talking to Batman, and she needs him to come closer. And it's scripted that she's a seductress. That's the qualities that, then no matter what I'm saying, there has to be that seductive quality. I mean, someone's drawing it, but I'm only lending the voice to it to get close enough. And because po Poison Ivy's, basically her venom lives in her lips, right? I mean, that, that is how she kills most of her. Yeah. <laughs> she would not, I mean, this is practical. How do you get someone close? Well, you certainly don't get them, you know, Hello, Batman can hear. Yes, that you can do, right? People will tend to unconsciously be drawn to that. But if I were to say it, Hello, Batman, come here! Right, that, that repels. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Historic, just because we, again, as human beings, you know, run from that kind of yeah. stuff. Yeah, and, and what I love about that is even, even the simplicity of volume used. You know, the seductive poison ivy voice you just did was a little bit softer a little bit lower, a little bit less threatening. But then the, 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 the one you just did Thanks there was louder. Yeah. Like, you know, and, and what, yeah. do, what, what do we do if we want to get a bear away from us? We make ourselves look big and we yell. Like, right. yeah. What do we do if we want to annoy our husbands? We say, pick up your socks. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's the thing is like what giving great voice allows you to do is be more conscious before you speak so you can recognize, well, what is my real intention? Because most of us live reactively. We feel, you know, we feel good and then we are in a great mood and then, you know, someone says something to us and then all of a sudden like our back, you know, our mood comes back, or it goes in a different direction. Then we respond to that and then usually, you know, especially with people we love the most, right, our mm. conversations. And I, I joked a lot in there and said even something that most of us can relate to that my husband knows exactly how I feel about him as soon as I've said his name. <laughs> yeah. You can all relate to that, right? Yeah. You don't have to. As soon as that the sound is out, it's not that I I've said honey instead of Harvey, but, but they're right now there. Most of us also we have our names for. So even you know my my children know you know if I say their whole name. Yeah. But then the tone, the intention. See that's what the, the talk is about. The remarkable power of tone and intention. So it's not so much the words we say all the time, but how we say them. How we say, could you pick up your clothes? Versus, could you pick up your clothes? Could you pick up your clothes? Could you pick up your clothes? Right? <laughs> Three different ways. Now, as a reactive mother, <laughs> I often fall into the category of the first. But I can teach <laughs> that, different you know, ones. And we could take this into business. Oh, yeah. Well, we could take this into our... I mean, this is so applicable. Yeah, yeah. And, and this is sort of what I also wanted to get into was now you teaching people how to use their voice to be more confident, to have messages delivered um, so people can list, people actually listen to you. So talking in a way that makes people want to listen to you. Uh -huh. um, all of these things. So um, I guess there's two questions there. So I'll ask the first one. Um, let's talk about confidence. Um, ha have you seen through your teaching um, someone gain confidence, you know, coming from maybe a little bit shy and secure, now you've taught them to, to harness their voice. And I, I see you smiling there. I usually ask people what's the one project that makes them smile. Um, yeah. Can can we go for an example of, of just pure confidence gain through voice? Sure. Because um, I, I actually taught, uh, I titled it when I was trying to get the essence, you know, the art of confident verbal communication. Yeah. Because it is an art to, you know, especially as humans when we don't feel 
inherently, I mean, all of us have our insecurities and it's totally normal, especially when we're trying to gain something, whether it's a job or the interview or the pitch or the date. I mean, you know, it's, 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 it's really hard to have that inner confidence. Um, but yeah, I've been very, very fortunate with the, the process that I do because giving great voice or to give great voice is, is a, it's a holistic process. And the first part of the act of giving great voice for me is to give it to ourselves first. And many of us suffer greatly with that, that we, that will easily tear ourselves down, but we will not think to verbally, you know, pick ourselves up. up. And so I always start with the inner, you know, dialogue. And um, I was fortunate enough to actually be a part of creating a tool called a Haven guided affirmation app, which I co-wrote and voiced. And that is a guided affirmation meditation that I, that very similar to poison ivy, by the way, it's a very, Soothing. <laughs> Number one, Fantastic. that is a self-confidence tool that I offer. It's completely free. Mm. Um, so that is something that I find that I can offer to my clients, but also really helping them to um, affirm themselves and, and, and to learn to speak the language of self-love and self-confidence, which I say often is a foreign language for most people. Mm. So I've, I've really helped people break down, you know, their roles and then also the voices in their heads and help them to rewire those voices to update the software, as it were, through this confident verbal communication, through the affirmations and also really, you know, understanding, uh, giving permission. A lot of people just don't give permission to themselves to say, I'm amazing. I love myself. I am going to kill it today. Right. It's like, that's cocky. That's over. no, it's actually fantastic because when you have that inner confidence, as opposed to a manufactured one where it's like lift up and have some strength. No, mm, fake it till you make it. Blah, blah, blah. Yeah. yeah. I, I approach it from an inner game and then we go out. But yeah, to see the evolution of many of my clients where again, through practicing it and rec- recognizing first how they speak to themselves and then, deciding, okay, what's the role I'm playing? And I even talk about it in the, in, in the TEDx talk about playing the role that is universal to all of us, the courageous, confident candidate, mm-hmm. which we must all play over and over and over. Most people well into their, you know, 60s, 70s. I mean, this is very rare that people have the same profession anymore for 40 years. Right. Yeah. So we're yeah. all in a state of having to pitch ourselves and gain ourselves. And we need that inner confidence, which then um, we can project through our voice once we understand those four questions again. So first we do the inner confidence, then we start thinking, okay, now I'm gonna, I'm gonna get the role, I'm gonna get this part. The role I'm going to channel is of the courageous, confident candidate. How does my voice sound? And again, we have to think about the qualities of the courageous, confident candidate, which I analyzed from, from um, employers and we made that an affirmation, a self-affirmation that we have those qualities. And then I did this whole other process of breathing and and VEAD, you know, it's an acronym. Very simple technique, but it's just literally kind of, you know, again, practicing deep breathing to get our our energy grounded, you know, and that uh, the simplest act of deep breathing, which most people, again, don't even think about. Yeah, don't And we let our beautiful energy come and then we're into the sympathetic nervous system which is that fight or flight response which does not help us play our roles mm. either as an actor or you know as a, a person. employee right I yeah. mean, so all of these qualities they're easy to learn these techniques you practice you work on it and then all of a sudden you do see little by little the transformation but i would say the greatest transformation comes with our self-speak okay yeah how so <laughs> Well, because again, it's, it's an inside job, right? We can, we can I, I call it, there's two sides of having um, the language of self-love, which is, you know, first you can have the, um, the confidence coach. I like the C's. You are amazing. You're going to kill it today. I feel so good. I'm dressed. I've got the part. I've already visualized and saying, may I offer you the role? Again, you know, you're acting the part. And then 
the compassionate companion. Wow, that was scary. I feel like I messed up, but that's okay. I love myself. I forgive myself and I'll start again, you know, tomorrow. That's the part that, you know, tends to be missing for so many of us, right? Well, it's like, I'm going to do it. And then perhaps again, you, it wasn't a hundred percent where you magnify the part that you didn't think. And then you just rip yourself apart. Like I suck and I'm never going to make it. Well, then you've just undone it. So I, again, you know, the give great voice to yourself is the both roles, the courageous, confident coach, and then the compassionate companion of like, that's okay. Yeah. Me and we'll get, we're, we, we're still fantastic and we'll try again tomorrow. So that's why I say those are the, if I could offer that to anybody and make that the takeaway, even more importantly, because I think that will inform <laughs> every oh, other yeah. Definitely, definitely. Um, and then also, I guess, uh, speaking so that people listen to you, I don't know how much um, – work or, or notice you've uh, done in terms of Jordan Belfort, the Wolf of Wall Street. Um, in terms of a salesman, fantastic, but he talks a lot about pitch, tonality, excitement in your voice, but then also like whispering and being a little bit softer, like, you know, being being like, you know, hey, John, how are you going today? Look, the reason for the call is, you know, we've got something really exciting out of the tech space and when you whisper people are like why, why are you whispering why have you got like clearly there's a secret you it's exciting so he uses tonality to sell right and get right. people to listen so how does how does what you do i guess could help someone in the business world get people to listen to them you know that's similar to i don't know if you knew that about jordan or not no i didn't i mean I know, I've, I've seen the movie so yeah. i know he, i didn't know he was uh, talking if you I go back you know, if so if you go back um and you ever watch the movie again that scene where leo um sells the first stock um yeah. like aerotine international yeah. um jordan belfort taught leo how to use his voice in right. that scene because wow. of, because that was how he taught his stuff yeah. and himself. Yeah. So right. you you should go and watch just that scene. I might even link it to you. I'll link it to you. Just watch that scene and then, and then, and then analyze it with your brain and go, Oh, hang on. This is a whole different side of voice. Like it's, you'll really enjoy it. I think you will. So I'll, I'll yeah, link no, it to you. Again, I think, you, you know, salesmen have been using this, these techniques for, eons. I mean, yeah. you go back to sales tapes, they discuss it. What I'm teaching isn't necessarily new. Mm. It's just from a different perspective and it gives it some, maybe it's less about, I want you to get your voice very quiet and then you're going to breathe them in. And it's, you know, and then, I, and then I want you to change your tempo and you're, it's a little bit less about the outside way and maybe more the inside way of understanding what is my intention. So perhaps if we go from what he's saying, the intention is you know, when you get your voice quiet, people do intentionally think, you know, intuitively think, oh, there must be a secret. There's something exciting because you're telling me and you don't want anyone else to know. These are, again, our inherent ways of what we, what we grow up believing, right? Yeah. Someone's whispering. So the intention is, as a voiceover actor in your own life, to think like, okay, I'm going to be pitching someone on the phone. Here's my script. Because usually, again, you you know you might Scripts. want to have a script. You don't want Incredibly to wing important. it. Incredibly right? important scripting, yeah. And you think, okay, in this scene, just like a voiceover actor when they're directing me, I want to take him into my confidence first. And then I got the, the part where I want to wow him. And then I want to wrap it up with the enthusiasm. So the first one is to inspire curiosity, which, of course, a whisper can. The second one is to be the voice of authority in the know. And then the third one is to say, the enthusiasm to say, are you coming with me? So there's, you know, I'm breaking it up like my in intentions and my voice follows that intention. And that is how every job that I do as a voiceover artist goes when I'm having a directed session where the client tells me, in this scene is the problem. That's usually how the first thing and then it, the solution is the answer and the voice changes to be more positive. And then the end is always like, now let's go in a direct, you know, a directive action. You know, again, do you direct somebody? Do you call to action? Like, I hope you'll go and do this. Or I hope you'll join me in doing this. 
there's enthusiasm, right? So this is what we, I, I do all day long is interpret scripts and then my voice is, is what my medium is. If we, he does it from maybe an outside in, I'm like, he knows that his one thing is to do a sale. So instinctively he learned those, the, those uh, you know, those tools and those ways to do it. I'm bringing that same concept, but that it's for your role as a mother, for your role as a father and a son and a daughter, and then how to, to get the $100,000 investment, how to gain the job by sounding like a very enthusiastic um, you know, candidate that is going to be not only trustworthy, loyal, um, intelligent, just, you know, dedicated all through, it's our body language, but our voice, which again, if you have your first phone call and they can't see your, you know, your hands or there, it's all You've got the voice. Through your voice. So I, I, I respect what he's doing and I just take it a little bit deeper um, so that, you know, this is nuanced and it, it, you know, it can feel like it's um, manufactured, but if you really understand the intention behind it, it feels less manufactured. I'm not yeah. asking you to put on a voice, to put on a voice, to put on a voice. I'm asking you to think, what's your intention? And then how will your voice support that intention? Because we understand, once we understand seduction, seduction, what that sounds like. And once we understand, well, we've got to make the people feel enthusiastic, then our voice will change because we know what the sound of enthusiasm sounds like. And if we don't, then we should study even more. And then I also say, borrow from your favorite people. Borrow from the favorite actors. Go and listen to the guy, you know, go and listen to, like you said, Leo either doing it or him doing it, so you know what it sounds like and practice that till it becomes something that you can organically do. Yeah, look, anyone listening along, I'll, I'll actually be, I'm tempted to put that scene, um, I'll put it that actually in the show notes for people to listen and go watch along because um, if you can listen to the principles that um, you're saying and really, you know, listen back to that scene and analyze it and go, Oh, hang on. This is how I can adapt it to my job. Um, that's incredibly, incredibly, incredibly powerful. So really, really cool. Um, I actually think that's a really, really cool spot to end it on. Um, but I've got two more questions that I ask everybody that comes onto the show at the end here. Um, the first one being what's coming up for you in the next sort of six to 12 months that you're really excited about might be a new project might be a new thing you're launching um that you want people to get behind might even be a challenge that you're excited to get over um yeah but what's happening in the next six to 12 months that you're really really excited about well since i've had this tedx talk come out um yeah. this is kind of like to me this rep and it's called give great voice and i i i I'm himself. sorry, we didn't even talk about the TEDx talk. I, I just realized. Well, we this. didn't in terms of we didn't frame it, but I did the TEDx yeah. talk to take all of this information that we've shared and basically consolidate it into 16 minutes. I'll put this. Um, I'll also put that in the link of the description because I, I watched it in preparation of this show. I usually do a bit of research, but um, amazing talk. Well, you did a really good job, obviously. Um, so yeah, yeah, sorry, I cut in there, but well, that's um, okay. yeah. I'm using that kind of as a launching pad to go and utilize the same principles in workshops, getting great voice workshops for corporations as well as webinars, as well as colleges. Cause I really feel strongly that, that, that is a key area, especially with the voiceover background and the animation and kind of a, a great way for me to combine these qualities and go and help college students that are going out into the world and having to give great voice. And especially if they don't feel as confident because they're not growing up the same way we were, which we were lucky enough to say that we didn't have the technology. Um, because I do feel that again, that's part of my messaging is that not only is it once we get that confident verbal communication or in order to have it, not only do we have to understand it, but we have to practice using our voices more. Mm. And that as a society and as humans, we need to use our voices more because we're using them less. And I feel like especially the isolation that, that comes from that. Because of this. Yeah. You know, um, we're, we're using our voices less. Edward Zia, um, fantastically, when he sends LinkedIn messages, he does it over voice. Um, and I've started, I've started doing that now or a video. Yeah. Um, 
it, you know, but we, we are so ingrained to just type. Yes. But and that's, that's my true mission. Like underneath all the other stuff is, you know, I'm bringing voice back. I mean, yeah. that's my, <laughs> my goal is to not only get people to be confident, but to use it again for our social and emotional health mm. as well as our, our success. That's why I talk about it, playing our professional personal roles more successfully. It's and actually, it, there are ways to do that because it's so imperative um, as we become more and more digitized. And so that's why I want to go at the college oh, and go to it, it's actually. Yeah, that's that's so powerful because one of the things I found when I first got Facebook, I'm a social person, right? If I'm not social with people, I I, I really it, it affects my mental health. As soon as um, social media came around, I could have eight conversations at the same time, but now I'm just typing to people, and it was really really interesting the shift of two months of doing that rather than picking up the phone and calling someone and talking to them. You know, I, I felt like I lost my voice because all I was doing was Facebook. Um, and I'm not blaming Facebook for that. Like, it's an amazing platform to connect with people. But I realized, and after going, going to therapy and sort of talking about that, um, going, oh, you, instead of typing to people, talk to people. You know, instead of typing to people, send a voice message. Instead of, you know, sometimes it's more practical to type, but, but, yeah. Well, you know, I say typing and t- texting is wonderful for factual based information. It's great. Yeah. For emotional connection and to feel nourished emotionally, which we need as humans, it's imperative to use our voices. Yeah. And, and that is, again, part of the platform of what it means to give great voice. And not, not only to, you know, it's three parts to ourselves, for ourselves, and to those we love. Yeah, that is the holistic, and I think you know. Again, it, it's something that we're all feeling, and not everyone's naming, but it's 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 getting more important, I think, than ever to um to to leave those voice mail messages. Oh, my dog wants to get out. Oh, okay. it's okay. We'll let, we'll let her out. And, yeah, go let her out. She's laughing. Hold on. That's yeah, okay. All good. All good. Uh, she's giving me great wolf. Good, good wolf. <laughs> She's very direct. Um, but that's, again, my, my, my battle cry, my message. Like, you know, if you, if you want to get in touch with somebody and you're DMing them on my Instagram, I DM three people yesterday with a voice message and they DM me back and on my texting. And it feels so much more yeah. connected than when I receive a text. So that even if we don't get to have a real time conversation, which I encourage you, it's still better than the emoji factor. Fantastic. Fantastic. Yeah, so that's well, what I'm doing. I'm, I'm just basically taking my voiceovers, which I'll continue and hoping to create and grow this platform that I can encourage people, help them, guide them, teach them to feel more confident and then to keep kind of banging the, you know, hashtag it's cool to call, getting people, especially young people, um, more uh, in line with using this beautiful, powerful instrument more than our phones uh, you know, or using our phones as a means of doing a FaceTime or doing that voice. Use now. the technology. Yeah. Yeah. Use the technology to our advantage because I, I feel like, again, this is a, we're at a very um, pivotal moment in time where we, we can really go the wrong way and, and you know, it'll be, it'll be too late and I don't want it to be too late. I want it to be something that, um, you know, we, we can inch back towards it. I think people are really hungry for it. I think they're really connecting to this message. Fantastic. Well, the, and the last one, if somebody has heard something across this show and they want to reach out to you, they want to improve their voice, they want to um, do something with that, how can they reach out to you? Um, where, where's the best place where we can follow along your story and, and your content? Sure. Um, well, I'm, I'm TejaValenza.com. Um, or givegreatvoice.com. I mean, I'm kind of like, again, I'm like this too, <laughs> I'm not sure exactly where I lead people, but Tasha Valenza is the safest one, and I'm on LinkedIn, and I'm on Facebook and Instagram, but I do have the website, Give Great Voice, and I do have those. So it, however you find me, either use my name, Tasha Valenza, or Give Great Voice, and uh, I would love to be able to support you individually or your school or your corporation, but I, yeah. I am, as you can hear, quite passionate about it. 
Fantastic. Well, Tasia, I've been Tim, you've been Tasia, and we've been talking. Thank you for... <laughs> That's a lot of tease. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you for coming on. Yeah, it's been a, a thrill. And again, you know, this exemplifies exactly what I love about uh, what I call Get Great Voices, that I've enjoyed your energy so much and I appreciate so much your, your great questions. And it's, it's not only been a thrill to share it, but it's filled me up. So thank you. Fantastic. Fantastic.